Hey, I'm Nathaniel Fawson. I'm a professional archaeologist currently excavating in northern Texas, and I specialize in the pre-colonial archaeology of North America's eastern woodlands, and that's where I've been working and studying for about the last 10 years. Um, I know I've been gone for a minute. My company sent me off to do a project where we were working every single day with almost no time off for about a month, so I haven't had time to work on any of uh, the stuff on my channel. But um, getting back into it, I want to talk briefly about what we call the Shell Mound Archaic. And I've mentioned this cultural phenomenon in a few other videos, like the Abandonment and Resettlement video that I'll post a link to in the description. Um, the Shell Mound Archaic is a cultural phenomenon where groups of people started building monumental structures out of mollusk shells in similar ways to how other cultures were building earthworks around the same time. And there are a couple of key reasons where this happens in the Archaic period. Um, I'll throw a link to the video explaining archaeological time periods down in the description also, in case you need to catch up on what Archaic means. Um, one of the, the regions is along the coast of Florida up into the Carolinas, where marine mollusks are available. Um, and with this group, there's always the discussion of whether these structures are intentional monuments or if they're just the natural byproduct of intensive shellfish consumption. And I tend to think that the one turned into the other over successive generations of reusing the same places on the landscape for the same function. That shell builds up and then you kind of see it and recognize that as that's the place that we go to have these, uh, these shellfish feasts. The other region is the one that I'm much more familiar with. In uh, That's the area between the Tennessee and Ohio rivers, so kind of north of Kentucky down to the northern part of Alabama. And these mounds, like the Mulberry Creek Shell Mound, are massive in the same way that a structure like Mound A at Poverty Point is, is massive. They're, they're really impressive features on the landscape. And this kind of tradition was only possible because the Tennessee River Valley especially is home to the greatest diversity of freshwater mussels anywhere in the world. So these inland shell mounds become a, a much bigger structure than that would have required a lot of time and work to collect all the mussels, to cook them, and then to add the shells from the cooking to the structure. And this is a point where the, the shell mounds are really a different from Mound A at Poverty Point. You might remember that we're pretty sure that Mound A was built in a couple of months and that's not the case with shell mounds. These things are made by successive feasting events that occur over the course of years for generations. Um, they're also very different in that these people buried their dead inside the shell mounds, and these are either the at the very early stages of construction, possibly as part of like a consecration ritual, or later as they're being added to, as the mounds are being built up, often um, with elaborate or exotic grave goods. And this is very different to, to their contemporaries in Louisiana who don't seem to have buried people in the earthen mounds, um, like Poverty Point or Watson Break. There's also some suggestion of human sacrifice at these sites, where multiple individuals are buried together in interesting qu clusters of four to six individuals. So for instance, there's a site called 1CT17 in Alabama and there, there's a group burial that includes an infant, a child, an adolescent, and an adult, along with a cremated juvenile. So kind of each stage of life is represented in this group of burials, and each was also buried in a different way. So one was fully extended, uh, straight out like you would in a coffin. Um, one was in the fetal position, which archaeologists called flexed burials. Um, one was with the legs bent back, which we call partially flexed and one was fully disarticulated into a bundle, and then of course the fifth one was cremated. So these burials also had um, an assortment of grave, grave goods like uh, shell beads and uh, bear jaw gorget or necklace. Um, it does appear that individuals buried within the shell were somehow special. There are often um, non-shell burial areas that were used for the general population nearby so being buried in shell itself may have been reserved for human sacrifices or other individuals who died in unusual ways like violent conflict or by some natural phenomenon like um, Cheryl Clausen mentions being struck by lightning is one possibility. And uh, grave goods at these sites have been analyzed a lot of different ways um, with some interesting results. So for example, infant burials 
disproportionately include exotic items that had to be brought from far away, like marine shell, and as opposed to freshwater mussel shell. Um, and at Mulberry Creek, Creek uh, grave goods in general were more likely to have been given to individuals who were buried fully extended, and these also showed signs of violent death or traumatic death, like um, embedded spear points in the body or scalp marks, things like that. So I hope you found that interesting. Um, I'm glad to finally have time to work on this kind of content again. If you've got any questions about the Shell Mound Archaic um, archaeology of the Southeast or the Eastern Woodlands in general, please leave those in the comments. And as always, thank you for watching.